what will we find in today's Thursday thrillers here on the Mutual Audio Network? A few baffling mysteries? Perhaps a touch of murder? Let's find out. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. The Mysteries of Dr. John Thorndike. Thorndike is the original fictional forensic detective from the early 1900s, using science to aid the art of detection to bring criminals to justice. This time, presenting The Spinster's Guest, written by R. Austin Freeman, adapted for radio by Heather Elliott. This is a ripping party, isn't it? A what party? <laughs> I just love dances, all dolled up. Ooh, look at that humdinger of a dress. Thank you for the dance, Miss Emily. Would you care for Christopher. some... Christopher! Yes, love? Miss Hallowell is looking for you. A lady has been taken ill. Will you come and see what the matter is? Please excuse me, Miss Emery. A doctor's day is never his own. <laughs> Thanks for the dance, anyway. You saved me, love. I was bored from lack of intelligent conversation. Nice girl. Oh, Christopher, the sick woman is Mrs. Chater, a very wealthy American widow. Edith Hallowell and Major Podberry found her laying in the shrubbery all alone and unable to give an account of herself. Poor Edith is dreadfully upset. She doesn't know what to think. What do you mean? You found your husband. Do hurry, please, Dr. Jervis. Such a shocking thing has happened. As Julia told you, come with me down to the pond. She's a few feet down the embankment. Thank heavens she didn't roll into the pond. Major Podberry's with her. How is she, Major? Still not coherent, Miss Hallowell. Uh, uh, We'd better carry her to the bench. Then we can consider moving her into the house. I'll take your lantern, Christopher, and Edith can take yours, Major. Thank you. Ready, Doctor? <clears throat> there we go. Lay her down on the bench. What is it, Dr. Jervis? What's wrong with her? I can't say, but she's not intoxicated. Thank God for that. It would have been a shocking scandal. What is the square red mark on her face, Christopher? Just a minute, love. Hmm. Now this complicates matters. What does? Uh, By your feet under the bench. A square pad of cotton wool and a nearly empty one-ounce vial labeled methylate chloroform. Pick up those for me, please. Why would she have chloroform? A number of reasons. It doesn't appear to be a robbery. She still has her diamond necklace and bracelet. Is there anything we can do for Rebecca? Not until the chloroform wears off. Give me a hand, Major. Is there a place she can lie down, Miss Hallowell? Yes, of course. There's a small room off the kitchen. I'll bring some smelling salts. Here are the smelling salts. Thank you. Oh! Ew! How are you feeling, Rebecca? Where am I? Inside the house. Major Podbury found you partially down the slope by the pond. Yes, I remember I was sitting outside in the cool night air. My tooth was aching dreadfully, so I used a bit of chloroform to ease it. Is this your vial and wool? Had them on the bench next to me when, out of nowhere, a hand came from behind me and clamped it over my face. How horrible. With the amount of chloroform missing from the vial, you would have lost consciousness immediately. Did you see anything? Do you know who it was? No, nothing. Wait. He was in evening dress. I felt it on my head against his shirt front. Then he is either still here, or he has been to the cloakroom. He wouldn't have left the place without an overcoat. No, by Jove, that's true. I'll go and make inquiries. Mrs. Chater seems to be recovered. Juliet, love, would you mind? Go ahead, I'll stay with her. What did you find out, Podre? He's gone. Went off nearly an hour ago on a bicycle. Seemed in a deuce of a stew, the attendant says, and and no wonder. We're going after him in our car. Captain Sparker and Baker Jones and I care to join the hunt? No, thank you. I must stay with my patient. How do you know you're after the right man? Only one Johnny's left the party, so it has to be him. Besides, confound it, you've given me the wrong coat. Are you sure, sir? Perfectly sure. Come, hurry up, man. Give it to me. 
I'm afraid, sir, that the gentleman who has gone has taken your coat. They were on the same peg. I'm very sorry, sir. What the devil is the good in being sorry? How am I to get my coat back? Major, if the stranger has got your coat, then this coat must be his. I know, and I don't want his beastly coat. No, but it may be useful in identification. Well, I, I suppose it might give us some clues. I'll go without a coat. Ready, Sparker? Ready, sir. Attendant! Yes, sir. Would you be so kind as to keep this coat tucked away safely somewhere? Of course, sir. Thank you. How are you feeling now, Mrs. Chater? Horrible man. I'll have the police on him. It's a shame he didn't take any of my diamonds so I can add robbery to the charges of attempted murder. She's feeling better. I see that, love. It's best to let the police handle that, Mrs. Chater. By the way, Dr. Jervis, I think I ought to mention a rather curious thing that happened in connection with this dance. As hostess of the Spinster's Ball, all of the invitations were sent from here. We received an acceptance letter from a Mr. Harrington Bailey, who wrote from the Hotel Cecil. Now, I'm certain that no such name was proposed by any of the spinsters. Did you ask them? One of them, Miss Waters, had to go abroad suddenly, and we had not gotten her address. As it was possible that she might have invited him, I did not want to meddle. You should have. I'm very sorry now that I didn't. We may have let in a regular criminal, though why he should want to murder Mrs. Chater, I cannot imagine. There was a mix-up in the coat room, and the stranger left with Major Podbury's coat instead. I had the coat room attendant put the stranger's coat to the side. I would suggest that you get a description from your attendant and take that and the cloak down to Scotland Yard tomorrow. Hmm. I suppose I shall have to. But those officers might come back with him themselves, and I'll give him a piece of my mind when they do. <laughs> late nights and dull reading don't mix well, Christopher. You shouldn't stay out so late. You're distracting me with your involuntary vocal utterances. Well, maybe you shouldn't give me a dull problem to solve after I've been out. <sighs> Four hours of sleep. Now I remember why I don't often go with Juliet to dances. <laughs> Some movement might wake you up. Naturally. Mrs. Chater, Superintendent Miller, come in. My business associate, Dr. John Thorndike, Mrs. Rebecca Chater. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Chater. Dr. Jervis has probably told you about the attempt to murder me last night. Those army officers chased him nearly the whole way to London and found nothing. Well, now, will you believe it? I've been to the police. I've given them the description of the murderous villain. I've even shown them the very coat he wore. They tell me nothing can be done. In short, this scoundrel must be allowed to go free. You will observe, Doctor, that Mrs. Cheda has given us a description that would apply to 50% of the middle-class men of the United Kingdom. And she has shown us a coat with no identifying marks of any kind. And that expects us to lay our hands on the owner without a solitary clue to guide us. Now we are not sorcerers at the yard, we're only policemen. So I've taken the liberty of referring Mrs. Chater to you. What is it you want me to do? Why, sir, this parcel here holds the coat. In the pockets were a pair of gloves, a thick scarf, a box of matches, a tram ticket, and the key for a Yale brand lock. Mrs. Chater would like to know whose coat this is. <laughs> this is very kind of you, Miller, but I, I think a clairvoyant would be more to your purpose. Seriously, sir, I should be glad if you would take a look at the coat. We have absolutely nothing to go on, and yet we don't want to give up the case. I've gone over it most thoroughly and can't find a clue to guide us. Now I know that nothing escapes you, and I thought perhaps you might notice something I have overlooked. Something that would give us a hint where to start. Couldn't you turn your microscope on it, for instance? Well, very well, very well. Leave the coat with me for an hour or so, and I'll look over it. I'm afraid there's not the remotest chance of our learning anything from it, but even so, the examination will have done no harm. Um, come back around two o'clock. I shall be ready to report my failures by then.
And what does my learned brother suggest? I should look at the tram ticket first. Miller's suggestion wasn't such a bad one. Or explore the surface of the coat through the microscope. We'll take the latter measure first. The tram ticket might create a misleading bias. A man might take a tram anywhere, whereas the indoor dust on a man's coat appertains mostly to a definite locality. Yes, but the information that yields is excessively vague. True, and yet, as I've often pointed out, the evidential value of dust is apt to be underestimated. Dust from a tabletop is a fine powder of gray with no distinct character, just like any other dust. But when under a microscope, this gray powder is resolved into recognizable fragments of definitive substances. And those substances can be traced with certainty to the masses from which they detached. Exactly. I know you appreciate the value of dust almost as much as I do. Yes, but uh, surely the information provided from the dust of the coat of an unknown man must be too general to be of any use in tracing its owner. I'm afraid you're right, but we shall soon see. Let's get started. I've finished examining my slides. How do yours look, Jervis? I have uh, quite a little museum here. The usual fragments of wool, cotton, and other fibers from clothing and furniture. Your average dust particles of straw, husk, hair, and various minerals. Of course, the uh, chalk from the road at Rainsford. Uh, it's the other pieces that are interesting. Uh, do go on. In much greater quantity than uh, the others, I found various starches. Mostly rice, but also wheat. Fragments of the cortices of several seeds, several different stone cells, some yellow masses that uh, look like turmeric, black pepper resin cells, one port wine pimento cell, and one or two particles of graphite. Graphite? I found no graphite, but there are traces of cocoa and hops. Uh, may I see your slide with the graphite? Here. Uh, yes, this is undoubtedly graphite, and no less than six particles of it. We'd better go over the coat systematically. You do understand the importance of this. This is evidently factory dust, and that may be used to fix a locality. But I don't see how that will carry us any further. Uh, don't forget, Jervis, we do have a touchstone, the key that opens the Yale lock. If we can narrow the locality down sufficiently, Miller can take a tour of the front doors. But can we? I do doubt it. We can try. Clearly, some of the substances are distributed over the entire surface of the coat, while others are present only on certain parts. We must locate those parts and then consider what this special distribution means. Well, it took me an hour, but the nut result of the examination is this. The entire coat, inside and out, is evenly powdered with the substances from list A. Rice starch in abundance, wheat starch in abundance and smaller quantities of ginger, pimento, and cinnamon. Also fiber of cinnamon. Various seed cortices, stone cells of pimento, cinnamon, cassia, and black pepper, with other fragments of similar origin, such as resin cells and ginger pigment. No turmeric. In addition, there are on the right shoulder and sleeve traces of cocoa and hops, and on the back, below the shoulders, a few fragments of graphite. Ah, that is the data. And now, what are the inferences? Remember that this is not mere surface dust, but the accumulation of months beaten into the cloth by repeated contact. Dust that nothing but a vacuum apparatus could extract. Evidently, the particles found all over the coat represent dust that is floating in the air of the place that the coat is habitually hung. The graphite obviously was picked up from the seat and uh, cocoa and hops from the factories that the man frequently passes. Though I don't see why they're on the right side only. Uh, Jervis, that is a question of time and incidentally throws some light on our friend's habits. Going from home, he passes the factories on his right. Returning home, he passes them on his left, but they have stopped work for the day by then. Yes, <laughs> that seems reasonable. It's the first group of substances. List A. Uh, yes, uh, they seem to indicate the location of dwelling. He's clearly not a workman or a factory employee. Now, the rice starch, wheat starch, and a group of substances collectively designated spices suggest a rice mill, a flour mill, and a spice factory. What good is that? There are dozens of mills and factories in London. Ah, but a quick look in the post office directory should clarify things. 
I mean, let's look. Okay. Uh-huh. Four rice mills in London, of which is the largest, called Carbots in Dockhead. Now for spice factories. Just one moment. Six. Six spice grinders in London. One of them, Thomas Williams and Company, is at Dockhead. Dockhead. Uh, just, I mean, okay. None of the other spice factories are near any of the rice mills. The next question, then, is the flour mill. There are several listed as being in London, but none are near either a rice mill or spice factory, except for the St. Saviour's flour mills owned by Seth Taylor. Dockhead. This is really becoming interesting. Ah, indeed it is. Dockhead has the peculiar combination of factories necessary to produce the composite dust in which this coat hung. That combination does not exist anywhere else in London. Can the location explain the other deposits, like the graphite? I would suspect they are from other industries in the location. Uh, the trams which pass Dockhead also, to my knowledge, pass at no great distance from the black lead works of Pierce Duff and Company in Rowell Road. It's reasonable to think that the trams could collect particles of black lead on the seats in certain wind conditions. Payne's factory processes cocoa in Goat Street, Horsleytown, which lies to the right of the tram line going west. And there are several hop warehouses on the right side of Southwark Street going west. These are mere suggestions. Seems to point to Dockhead. Are there private houses at Dockhead? We must look up the street list to see that. The Yale brand latchkey rather suggests a flat and a flat with a single occupant. Let me look through here. If everything we've found are only a string of coincidences, (laughs) I've found yet another. On the south side of Dockhead, actually next door to the spice grinders and opposite Carbot's rice mills, is a block of workmen's flats. The Hanover Building. Aha, the Hanover Building. It fulfills our conditions exactly. A coat hung in a room in those flats with the windows open, which they likely are this time of year, would be exposed to air containing a composite dust of precisely the character of that which we have found. The same conditions could apply to other buildings, but that one seems the most likely. Uh, There may be some fallacy in our reasoning, but on the face of it, the chances are a thousand to one that the door that key will open is in some part of Dockhead, and most probably in the Hanover Building. Uh, Miller will need to verify this. Wouldn't it be as well to look at the tram ticket? Oh, dear me, I'd forgotten about the ticket. Yes, by all means. Oh, a coincidence. It's been punched from Tooley Street to Dockhead. Well, it's probably Miller at the front door now. I heard a knock a moment ago. Afternoon, gentlemen. I saw Mrs. Chater in her motor car turning in from Tudor Street. She'll be a moment. That's quite all right. Say now, Dr. Thorndike, have you got something to tell us? I do have a suggestion to make. I think that if Superintendent Miller will take this key to the Hanover Building, Dockhead, Bermondsey, he may possibly find a door that it will fit. The deuce! I beg your pardon, madam, but I thought I had gone through that coat pretty completely. What was it that I had overlooked, sir? Was there a letter hidden in it, after all? You overlooked the dust on it, Miller. That's all. Well, as I said before, I'm not a sorcerer. I'm only a policeman. Are you coming to see the end of it? Of course he is. And Dr. Jervis, too, to identify the man. Now that we've gotten the villain, we must leave him no loophole for escape. Well, we will come if you wish, Mrs. Chater, but you mustn't look upon our quest with certainty. We may have made an entire miscalculation. I am rather curious to see if the result worked out correctly. But even if we do run the man to earth, the most we can prove is that he was in your house and left hurriedly. We'll take my car. Stay in the car, please, Mrs. Cheetah. I'll pop in and check the basement rooms of the Hanover building. Coming, doctors? Uh, In a moment. Uh, Look at this, Jervis. Everything is coated with a fine white powder. No doubt from the flour and rice mills. And over there is the grayish buff dust from the spice works. Uh, Thus does commerce serve the ends of justice. At least we hope it does. No go there. We'll try the next floor. Let's go. Stay in the car, please, Mrs. Chater. I'll signal to you if we find him. I'll stand at the window and wipe my forehead with a handkerchief. Very well. Fifth floor. Last floor. 
I don't suppose you made any mistakes, sir? Oh, it's quite likely I have. I only propose this search as tentative proceedings, you know. <laughs> uh, I'll be an awful suck-in for Mrs. Cheta if we don't find him after all. She's counted her chickens to a feather. Last door to the left, Yale Lock. Have you got the key? You have it. He fits like a glove. You've run him to earth, sir, but I don't think our Mr. Fox is home. He can't have got back yet. And why not? Nothing's been disturbed. There's not a mark on the paint. Now he hasn't got his key, and you can't pick a Yale lock. He'd have to break in, and he hasn't. There's no letterbox on the inside of the door. My dear Miller, I could open that door in five minutes with a foot of wire and some resin string. I'm glad you're on the side of the law, sir. You'd be one too many for us. Shall we signal to the lady? I think so. There. She saw my signal. She'll be up in a few minutes. We've found his flat, ma'am, and we're going to enter. You're not intending to offer any violence, I hope. Of course I'm not. In the States, ladies don't have to avenge insults themselves. If you were American men, you'd hang the ruffian from his own bedpost. Um, we're not American men, Mrs. Chater. We are law-abiding Englishmen, and moreover, we are all officers of the law. These gentlemen are barristers, and I am a police officer. Open the door, please. I told you so, sir. He hasn't come back yet. I want to look around and see what sort of man would try to kill me. We're here, but we must be quiet in case he comes back. Why, there's nothing here. No curtains or blinds, just a little unfinished pine table and a chair. No rugs or anything at all. Jelly jar on the table looks like it's been wiped clean with a slice of bread. The rind from the Dutch cheese has been scraped down to thin. There's not enough food crumbs to feed a mouse. Let's look in the bedroom. How awful. Straw mattress on the floor, jute rug for a blanket, two crates acting as nightstands. A miserable life he must have. But look at that suit. It's well cut and fashionable. Shabby and wearing out at the hems. See? Silver cigarette case on the nightstand. Why on earth does this fellow starve when he has a silver case he can pawn? Wouldn't do it. A man doesn't pawn the tools of his trade. This can't be the man. You've made some mistake. This poor creature could have never made his way into a house like Willowdale. Well, take a look at the second suit under the newspaper. The shirt front is crumpled, but not from normal wear. And here, ha <laughs> ha, this is rather significant. What? A woman's hair. I wish he would come. Prison won't be much hardship to him after this, but I want to see him in the dock all the same. It wouldn't hurt him much to swap this for Portland Prison. Shh, he's back. He's sitting at the table now. Come along. Who are you? I am a police officer, and I arrest you uh, for... Stop! Stop! Mrs. Chater. I guess we've made a ridiculous mistake. This isn't the man. This gentleman is Captain Roland, an old friend of mine. I'm sorry he's a friend of yours, because I shall have to ask you to appear in court against him. Ask what you please. I tell you, he's not the man. Do I understand, ma'am, that you refuse to prosecute? Prosecute? Prosecute my friends for offenses that I know they have not committed? Certainly I refuse. Very well. Then we have had the trouble for nothing. I wish you a good afternoon, madam. <laughs> let's go. Uh, yes, Jervis, let's go. Just a minute, doctors. Why did you do it? <laughs> Look around me. Look at this. It was the temptation of a moment. I was penniless, and those accursed diamonds were thrust in my face. Mine for the taking. I was mad, I suppose. But you didn't take them. Why didn't you? I don't know. The madness passed, and then, when I saw you lying there... Oh, God, why don't you give me up to the police? But tell me, 
Why didn't you take the diamonds? You could have if you'd like, I suppose. What good were they to me? What did anything matter to me? I thought you were dead. Well, I'm not, you see. I'm just as well as an old woman like me can expect to be. I want your address so I can write and give you some good advice. My name is Augustus Bailey. Here is my card with address. Thank you. Now we'll go. Goodbye, Mr. Bailey. I shall write tomorrow and you must take seriously the advice of an old friend. We did know each other once, many years ago. He was a second lieutenant then. I expect you've written me down as a sentimental fool, Dr. Thorndyke. Ah, uh, it is written, blessed are the merciful. He's shown remorse, poor soul. I shall do for him what I can. Thank you for your time, Dr. Thorndyke and Dr. Jervis. I apologize it was all for naught. No apologies are needed, Mrs. Traitor. It's good for our own spirits to once in a while have a case that ends with hope. We see so much of the depraved side of mankind in our profession. You must come to Rainsford for dinner, both of you. And bring your dear wife, Juliet, Dr. Jervis. Have you a wife or lady friend, Dr. Thorndyke? Oh, no. Well, you leave that to me. Edith and I will put our heads together and find the perfect one for you. You'll see. Someone with enthusiasm, yet gracious and well-tempered. Intelligent, of course. Do you enjoy opera, Dr. Thorndyke? Oh, good heavens. The Mysteries of Dr. John Thorndyke. Written by R. Austin Freeman. Adapted for radio by Heather Elliott. Starring Dave Johnson as Dr. John Thorndyke. Roy Nessel as Dr. Christopher Jervis. Also in the cast were Beth Greaterex as Rebecca Chater, Jim Galan as Superintendent Miller, Allison White as Edith Hallowell, Cordelia Cloak as Juliet Jervis, Bob Helling as Major Podbury, Derek White as Augustus Bailey. Other parts played by Claudia Cimini and Francesco Misuraka. I'm your announcer, Ryan Barker. Sound design and dialogue editing, Jay Charles. Recording engineer, Jim Galan. Recording technician, Bobby Wiley. Directed and produced by Joseph C. McGuire. Recorded in partnership at KSVR Studios in Mount Vernon, Washington. This was a Radio Theater Project presentation.